On this week's episode, we've got Dr. Jackson Garth joining us from the southeastern part of the United States. Uh, he's specifically coming to us from Georgia. Now, as the hemp industry and the hemp movement, if you will, has kind of really grown after the passage of the Farm Bill, Dr. Uh, Dr. Garth, uh, living in Georgia, it, just generally the South, uh, the South is not very friendly when it comes to the cannabis and hemp side of of the industry so he has one hell of an uphill battle already with that living in the south uh trying to convince generational farmers or southern farmers uh that this is the way to go this is the future to get away from cotton or and or whatever uh other crops that they were growing and he has really positioned himself to be a key player if not one of the largest players in the hemp industry going forward uh, I'm really excited to have him on this week. Uh, we talk about what he's got going on. Uh, he's been silent up until now, which a word to the wise to all you aspiring entrepreneurs out there, instead of blasting it all over social media, uh, I'm, I'm to blame for that as well. Uh, I've done that in the past and it came back to bite me. Uh, usually you kind of jinx yourself, uh, but they say, don't announce your moves before you make them. And he is a prime example of doing that. Uh, he had to hold back everything, getting his infrastructure in place, uh, and they've moved in from uh, just doing the cultivation side to now offering uh, a, a fund, uh, actually access to capital for people in the hemp and cannabis space. And Verde Leaf is doing one hell of a job. Uh, so I'm really excited to bring to you guys Dr. Garth uh, coming to us all the way from Georgia. And so without further ado, here we go, Dr. Garth. You got me loud and clear? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right. Very nice. All right. Yeah. So busy, busy man, huh? Yeah, it was, it was, it's been a busy day. Busy, busy couple weeks. So. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> That's what it seems like. It seems like it. So uh, what, are you guys getting ready to plant? Yeah. So we, we have, we're planting, um, million and a half seedlings but uh how many acres that's going to be but we we're probably going to have um uh, close to five or six hundred acres going in with covid it changed everything we we're supposed to have close to a thousand acres but we'll probably have about 700 or so right yeah. and how long how long have you guys been working on the the cultivation side uh probably about two years uh we end up finding the company that really had worked on genetics for the Southeast, um, where they did uh, really looking at the genotype and really kind of kind of coming up with a strain that would be good for the humidity here. Um, a lot of the strains that we found coming from Oregon or Colorado didn't do too well in the humidity in the Southeast. So these guys had kind of blended two, two different genetics together and got it strong. So it, they've been growing it for about three years here in the Southeast. And then we started working with them this year. Okay. What's uh what strain did you guys end up going with? Uh, it's called high cotton haze. And <laughs> so it's a mix between, it's a mix between two, like Hawaiian haze and then another blend. So, so what kind of yields are you guys expecting to get? Off the dry material, probably a pound and a half per plant. Okay. Are you guys growing for fiber or, or not fibers? Um, Smokable flour or, or mostly oil? Uh, both. So okay. one of the things that we're doing, um, for a lot of our smokable flour will go into some of our tobacco substitute products. So you'll find the um, some of our cigarettes, our pre-rolls. And we're doing, you know, we partner with a company that um, are doing more traditional cigarettes. So the packs of CBD cigarettes or the hemp cigarettes versus kind of the, the hand roll looking uh, pre-rolls. Right. So we're doing that. And then we have a um, a pouch, a snuff pouch that's going to be coming out as well. So we'll put our smokable flour into those things that are going to stores. And then for our oil, that are going to our consumable products uh, and some non-consumables as well. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, I used to be a dipper for the longest time. I was in the, the army for 13 years. So, you know, dipping yeah. is kind of a part of my life. So it's uh, yeah. I've, I've seen a couple of those products. I haven't really had a chance to test them, you know, to kind of see how it's going to work out because, you know, with the with the tobacco, it's really uh, it's moist. You know, the the, the snuff, right. the, the dip, it's moist. So how how do you guys go about like actually putting the CBD into that? Is it going to you said it's in a pouch like so they, we have a machine that um, will make the pouches just like traditional dip pouches, snuff pouches. And then, you know, our creators, one of the things that they're doing, our partners, they're making sure that it has the moisture in there. So, you know, with traditional dip, if you if you have that out there for 30, 40, 50 days, when you open it up, it's still going to be moist. And so right. they're making sure it has the same kick that the snuff would have. So to have the same kick same moisture everything so they're building and creating that and kind of going through r&d right now to make sure we have that product so that it has the right moisture has the right consistency has the right kick where you're getting it so because like you said you know guys who will use tobacco they'll get a little bit of a kick so we're trying to make sure we have it we simulate that interesting interesting that'll be interesting to see good luck with that one <laughs> yeah yeah it's, it's we have some cool products Right. Um, the thing that we were trying to do is make sure that we're looking at more Gen 2 products that could go on store shelves versus the traditional gummy and tinctures. Right. We're going to still do those things, you know, gummies, tinctures, pain creams. But we wanted to have kind of more mainstream products that people can associate with, whether it's beverages or gum or, you know, um, dip or cigarettes or whatever. It's really creating... Um, a better for you. Uh, that's one of the things that our partners on the beverages, they, they talk about that as a better for you brand or line of products that um, are just help, more healthy, but still substitute some of the, the negative things that you have with other substitute products. Now, with the size of operation that you guys have going on, um, is all of this going to be under the, uh, the Verde Leaf um, kind of conglomerate, or are you guys going to start white labeling, uh, you know, going forward? Or No. Well, so all of our, like our, our Gen 2 products will be under the Verde Leaf brand. Okay. But we still do, um, the, the thing that we're looking at doing is just having different sales channels. So for me, being, um, you know, my background's in healthcare, and then I've been in this industry for three years, one of the things you always found is you would have companies uh, work for Pfizer and they had like big blockbuster products. And one of the things that we wanted to do was say, okay, as going into pharmaceutical companies, we're going to different disease states. We were looking to say, let's go into different sales channels. Mm -hmm. And so the oil and the products that we're making will go into different channels, whether it's big box chains or, um, you know, pet products or different things like that. So that's how our oil be distributed but you still have a need of people who want white label products to then go into cbd stores so we'll kind of separate those out and go okay these are our cash cows right. that we'll have on you know you know the sit goals the circle k's and big stores grocery stores those will be the products that we put out but then we still will make quality white label products that we'll be able to have your your normal person who wants to have 10 cbd stores they'll still have great products that are still cutting edge but we okay. don't want to cannibalize you know, our market share by then white labeling are really great products. Right. Know? That makes, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, because I grew up in the South. Uh, I was born in a um, military family. I was born in Germany, spent most of my life in Texas, uh, went to mm -hmm. basic training in, uh, in Fort Benning, Georgia. So I spent a good amount of time in Georgia. Uh, right. let's see, North Carolina, Fayetteville, North Carolina for 18 months. Uh, and then finished my career down in Florida. So I've, you know, lived in the South my entire life. So, so speaking of which, the South is a completely different dynamic when it comes to this sort of, uh, you know, side of the market because it's not the traditional CBD store, dispensary, et cetera. So how is the South kind of forming in your eyes in the market share for you guys compared to the normal, you know, retail outlet for dispensaries slash CBD stores? Well, it's, you know, we're in the Bible Belt, so it's going to be different um, in terms of the products. I think the benefit that we're doing is we're making products that are easy to accept. You know, right. when you have people who are being health conscious, um, you know, the beverages that we're making are, you know, very similar to things that people want to see. And then 
um, like with the dip and stuff like that, easier for people to, you know, accept because it's mm-hmm. one of those things where they're used to it. Like you were saying, you, you know, you were comfortable with the dip. It's like, Hey, it's a healthier choice for a transition. And that's the thing that you see with the South It's medical cannabis is one of those things that's, it, it's been a little bit slower to pick up because it's the stigma of being cannabis. I think with hemp, one of the things that we've seen in the South is they've been a lot better in terms of differentiating those products. And so it's easier for legislators and people to say, hey, I understand it's the difference between CBD and cannabis. And so by us using products, those Gen 2 products that people are already used to, but just adding CBD, you have an easier adaptability where people right. aren't giving you as much pushback. And that was that really was the thing of what types of products are we going to – because smokable flour is too close to cannabis, and people are going to give you pushback. But if you put right. it in a dip or you put it in cigarettes, that's acceptable, you know? Yeah, because, I mean, so. there's going to be a lot of pushback from law enforcement, like you said, uh, you know, and also the legislators because they're going to see a joint or they're going to see somebody with flour. They're going to be like, okay, green plant. Yeah, you do the cigarettes or you do the dip then they're less likely to go, wait a minute, you know? And that, and that was something when I was creating, because I love branding and marketing. That's what I went to school for. Okay, That's one of the things that even if you look at the Birdie Leaf logo, um, I was very intentional about not having a cannabis flower because that then rubs people the wrong way. If right. you look at our logo, it's kind of a an offtake of the flower, but it's still corporate enough where people can go, they can see that on drinks and cigarettes and everything else and go okay this doesn't make me feel uncomfortable right yeah it doesn't have like you know the sharp jagged edges and you know look right like the old exactly. school pot yeah i like that yeah because i mean you know being in this industry like you know it's a lot of it is education and the stigma especially the south the south right. is huge i mean just look at jeff sessions you know as soon as jeff sessions was appointed attorney general and then uh, you know, tr- Donald Trump was starting to go after, um, you know, cannabis. And then it was just Jeff Sessions, Jeff Sessions. And everybody knew what Jeff Sessions was potentially going to do. And nobody right. liked it. You know, nobody liked it because Donald Trump was saying, oh, it's, you know, up to the states. I'm going to legalize it, you know, this, this, and this, and all these promises and all that BS and whatnot. And then Jeff Sessions comes in. Everybody's like, wait a second. Hold up. What are we doing here? You know, so, right. I mean, the South has had to and- overcome a lot more hurdles when it comes to this, you know, this side of the house, the cannabis alone. But I mean, cannabis has been, quote unquote, legal in the country longer than hemp has, which is it's kind of interesting to, right. to see. And it's 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 one of those things you got to think about it for me, um, excuse me, as a black man going around the southeast. Um, a lot of the farmers and a lot of the farms that we're working on are farms that my ancestors and a lot of my people's ancestors, you know, African Americans have worked, you know, Mm -hmm. so it's crazy to see like old cotton gins or, you know, these farms that, you know, cotton was grown on, then turn around and hemp's grown on. And it's, you know, it's the acceptability because it really is, we can't get away from, like you said, Jeff Sessions and everything that's going on with, you know, the president and everything was going on. A lot of legislators want to get it approved, and they're saying, okay, how do we tax it? How do we create that revenue while still dealing with the stigma of cannabis and then mass incarceration? And so that's one of the things where, I, for me, when I came into this industry, I said I was going to run after hemp because it was going to be less of a stigma. It was just more education. Mm -hmm. You know, no matter what you do with cannabis or medical or recreational, it's still that stigma. With hemp, it doesn't have that stigma. It's just educating people to show that hemp is different in terms of CBD and all the products than cannabis, and then show them the benefits of it. Exactly. You know, yeah. and I think I think as those products come on board, and there's more accept, you know acceptance of CBD products and the benefits and all of that, I think it then opens up the door for you know mass approval for cannabis because then people see it as more of a medicine and not just as people, you know, kids laying around and getting high. Yeah, yeah I think that's the stigma <laughs> that, that is like you're just laying around in your basement getting high. And I think once we show with CBD and the benefits and, you know, um, you know that it is a real medicine to help people with pain and anxiety and, you know, the different areas that you see the benefits of CBD, then I think with cannabis, it'll be, it'll come in and be widely accepted. 
because that stigma is going to be decreased. Now, um, I haven't really been paying attention to the South as far as um, uh, the medical side of cannabis with legalization. I know that Louisiana is legal for med. Um, is Georgia legal for cannabis? Yeah, medical? It is. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Georgia's Georgia's legal, and then uh, the voting is supposed to come down for. Um, dispensaries and all. And I think the way they're going to do it is going to be like nine licenses and they'll have three for really large vertically integrated groups and then three for mid-size and then three for really small groups. And so, and then the, the universities will get them. So I think 2014, maybe, um, cannabis was approved medical. And then they were going through and the last part is just how do we, they proved it so you could have it, but the issue is then how do you get it? And so that still left a huge where you're trying to either get it from across state lines or off the black market, where now they're opening it up to be able mm-hmm. to have dispensaries. So that should be approved. I think this summer they're going to try to do that. Okay. So interesting. And you know, it, it's, it's interesting to see how dispensaries from one side of the country has been deemed essential. And on the other side of the country, they're non-existent, you know, right. it, it's, it's fascinating to see that. And uh, like you said, you know, the South usually kind of is slower to adopt the more, um, you know, it, I guess historically you could say a left leaning, uh, you know, agenda with cannabis legalization, you know, because it's more right. a pro left side of the house. And then, you know, obviously right. the, the South is mostly, I would say, you know, red, uh, you know, right. uh, highly, highly Republican. So, um, oh, definitely. And see, here's the thing you can think about. Think about this. For me, one of the reasons why I say, well, yeah, I live in the South, but I was saying, Focusing on the Southeast, because when you think about, you know, back in history, in terms of, you know, the United States, when you talked about the Civil War and the South wanting to separate, it was to keep the slave trade alive, to keep the cotton, because that was free labor. You think about all the farmland we have here in the Southeast Mm -hmm. that really will be able to produce so much hemp, because you'll, you know, where somewhere like Kentucky or Ohio, they'll get one grow in. Some places in the South, they might be able to get three grows in, mm-hmm. at the minimum two grows, because of the amount of daylight we're getting. Yep. So a lot of our farms will be able to definitely do two grows, so you're really multiplying the amount of biomass you're going to be able to produce for products you're going to do. So farmers are going to make double what the average, you know, in the Southeast will make double what a farmer, once they learn how to do it, what a farmer in Kentucky will do, or potentially a farmer in Colorado or Ohio, because mm-hmm. those climates are you know, a little bit more colder, you know, in the Southeast, you're going to have longer days and then, you know, a warmer temperature. Right. So speaking of that, and uh, we mentioned this earlier, um, you know, where the the hemp industry is going, especially in the Southeast, like you said, you know, the old plantations uh, back in the day, just large, massive amounts of land growing a commodity. Right. Do you see the South transitioning from, say, a CBD side of the house to more of an industrial hemp and fiber side? Eventually, yeah. I think one of the things with one of the things that you see, you see, and I always, when I'm doing talks, and I look at things from a salesman standpoint of we have to have exit strategies. And so you see a lot of like really large processors, right, who spend all this money, but they didn't have the contracts on either side, whether it was the farmer or the sales channels. And so they were a sitting dormant asset that wasn't able to do anything. When we look at the fiber side of this business, we have to begin to look and see who are going to be the early adapters and where does that product go? It's similar to like CBG. Who's going to be the people buying it? Because if we don't have anyone purchasing it, you're literally growing products for no one to come buy them. And then that's not benefiting the farmer. But I do believe over time um, with different textiles and then people adapting and understanding the benefit, as you talk about temporary and insulation and, you know, different, you know, linens, bed linens and pillows and all that stuff. I believe that will come into play. But right now it's 90% of the market, 95% of the market is just CBD because that's where people are in terms of the educational level. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that you end up, what we're dealing with is just education. Once people catch up to it and understand it, then I'll think there'll be more introduction into hemp into the fiber side. And it, it really will take off because of the, the durability and sustainability. So that's a very green product that we'll be able to use. It's just educating individuals how they use it, 
and then how they kind of weave it into the products that we already have and then where those sales channels. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And you know, the, the biggest thing, like you said, is education, especially with the farmer, you know, because they're going to be growing you know, a certain crop for so long. And then it's like, wait, you mm -hmm. want me to do what now? Cause I remember whenever this whole thing, this was pre farm bill, um, reaching out to, to farmers, you know, in the South specifically, uh, in Florida, uh, Northwest Florida, you know, that were growing cotton that were growing, uh, you know, smaller, you know, plots of land, um, you know, with the, the, the textile commodities, um, and, you know, trying to talk to them about hemp and they thought it was marijuana, you know, just from as soon as you say, Hey, you know, I'd like to talk to you about growing hemp on your property. And they're like, wait, you mean marijuana? So, you know, there's, like right. you said, there's just that stigma and that, uh, you know, that, that not lack of education, just, you know, ignorance, you know, it's not a bad thing. It's right. just, it, it is what it is. And actually mm -hmm. this, uh, this shirt is made out of hemp. This is a, a Patagonia hemp shirt that this is from their spring 2020 line that, uh, that wow, I was very nice. To, yeah. I was fortunate enough to get. So, I mean, Patagonia is in it, they get it, you know, and it's only a matter of time, you know, because the mm -hmm. people that are growing cotton, I'm not a farmer. I don't understand the numbers, you know, when it comes to that side of the house, but like you said, it's, it's, um, it's going to take a lot of resources and just the supply chain and the logistics behind it is like you said, going to be, you know, probably very capital in uh, intensive and the early adopters who are, you know, who's going to come in and, and start benefiting from that. So what is the long-term projections for Verde Leaf when it comes to the fiber side? Because you, I mean, you really have to kind of be looking at that, you know, because there's an end game with CBD and then, you know, what other cannabinoids might come onto the scene, but those are going to be kind of tertiary. What is the main goal of, of Verde Leaf going forward with textiles? Do you guys want to just be, uh, you know, manufacturers or do you guys want to be actual, you know, producers? No. So we, we already have a plan in place for textiles as well. So we have a five kind of, sales channel approach for the CBD side, uh -huh. whether it's, you know, branded products that we have going into big box stores, or it's doing and showing that we can scale to a certain level with the farms that we have, and then just sales channels, then that we could be ready and prepared for really large branded companies to say, okay, they want to get into the CBD market, us being able to then partner with them, because we show that we have sales channel distribution logistics, and we can handle that scope of what products, whatever large scale that is. On the textile side, on the industrial side, um, it really will be, we have a two-pronged approach where we're gonna do uh, looking at, you know, hempcrete fibers, doing some housing stuff there, and then also doing, um, you know, linens and textiles and all of that, like bedding stuff, where we would have a decor line, um, a home decor line of products. So it's, you know, it's CBD and then it's going, um, you know, textiles um, in terms of some hempcrete and all that. But then also we have kind of a, a tiered approach to start going to work with the military as well. So we've been looking at that, to talk about like, um, eventually start talking about um, uniforms and all that stuff and using that. So it's kind of a three-step approach where you're going, right. you know, business to business, um, in terms of how companies will be able to use it and providing, you know, linens and all those things. And then also looking at the, um, you know, the crete, the, the concrete and the, the you know, the, the uh, insulation, but then eventually being able to show as you go proof of concept, then do something large scale like the military. So we're definitely looking at that. Awesome. That's great. Uh, I mean, I've actually had that talk with uh, some other people, uh, you know, with providing uh, textiles to, you know, not just the military, you know, anybody that wears a uniform, you know, hemp scrubs, mm -hmm. uh, you know, having like maybe a, a hemp MLB uniform, you know, because you know how they have the different right. style uniforms for like, you know, breast cancer awareness and, you know, the different holidays yep. and whatnot, you know, that who knows, you know, it could be uh, mainstream uh, in the next decade. Who knows? We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just, yeah, it's where, you know, I, I remember Mark Cuban saying, you have your innovators and then you have your, you know, innovators and early adapters, and then you have your imitators. Mm -hmm. And it's really, you have to see which, you know, pathway you're trying to go down. Um, and so, like we said, you know, CBD products are a cash cow right now, but we're investing in the R&D. So then we can be innovators on the, um, the textile side as well. And kind of doing the same thing that we're doing in terms of taking on large contracts 
for the CBD side, we want to do the same thing on the textile side. So I've been paying attention a lot to, to what you guys have going on over there, uh, you know, with your LinkedIn posts, your YouTube videos and stuff like that. Um, and you guys are offering a fund now. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah. So one of the things that, so we launched Verde Leaf Capital. Um, okay. Think about like GE Capital. Um, and what it is, is we're starting off this year, we're doing financing for services, crops, uh, their genetics, um, they need equipment, and we're doing the financing on that. And then our goal is next year, by the time we launch, to be able to have like crop insurance and some other services. These are just value added, you know, uh, products that we would add into our network, but it'll be to other farmers as well. And what it is is this once we started growing and looking at taking on a lot of these really large contracts, even though you're paying the farmers for their products and helping them cash flow positive. The issue is, as we begin to scale, I didn't want a lot of the farmers to take on that burden of being able to have that cash readily available. So I was saying, okay, we need to have a partnership to be able to make sure that if we need farmers to go from 50 to 100 acres. It's not an issue in terms of now we're limited on our growth where I've gone out and got great contracts, but our farmers can't meet that demand because of the cost. And so I wanted to remove that barrier entry into the market for them. So then what would happen is they could grow at the same scale as what we were growing at. So there are supply, but I needed them to be able to match our growth. And so by that, we just felt internally that if we were able to do funding, that would be something to limit that barrier to entry for our farmers. So it's just, we, we're trying to make it, like I said, with GE, where you go in and you want equipment, you want you know, services, you know, financial services, and then you want financing, that's all in-house and they can do all that. So if you're doing, you know, airplanes, whatever service you're going to them for, they provide all the services and on top of that, they'll finance it. And that's what we're really working to do. So then we're paying the farmers better than market because we own the back-end contracts, but also then um, we're helping them scale you know, in terms of farm equipment and the genetics and do all those things. So they're growing essentially with us. And so you guys would pretty much make the, the farm self-sustainable uh, separate from Verde Leaf or kind of like uh, a subsidiary of Verde Leaf? Uh, they will be, it, it's kind of, we're doing essentially JVs with them. Um, the farmers still own and control their farm. But you think about kind of how Reynolds Tobacco did, you know, they, they pretty much, these are the genetics, these are the things you grow, the farmers will buy them. They still manage and run their farm, but they have long-term contracts that are tied in to guarantee they sell their product. And so are you guys doing that currently, or is that something on the horizon? Yes. Okay. Yeah, no, that's what we do now. Yeah, okay. that's, our, that's what we do now. What kind of, if you might, don't mind my asking, what, what size of a fund are you guys working with? Well... Here, here's the thing. We have um, several, and I don't want to get into that side of it too much, but we have <laughs> several large uh, family funds who are tied in to say they were interested in funding this. Okay. So that's kind of how we developed it. So I don't want to give a number out, but right. for our farming, we can, you know, what we do, we'll, we do um, lines of credit, we do um, business loans, and we do short-term loans, and then we do credit cards too, So and equipment financing. So wow. The average farmer, it, they can do up to 250000 on a line of credit. So you guys are pretty much turning into a hemp bank, I guess. Yeah. So that eventually, <laughs> would, eventually that's what we would like to become then is like, I bank, like you being ex-military, you know, like I bank with USAA and I've never been into a USAA branch right. ever, mm -hmm. but I can still <laughs> use them to get all my services done. So we're looking at it doing the same thing where we want to make sure that we can provide all those services and then we're helping utilize that capital to put it to work to help our farmers. So it's, it's connecting the world. Think about it. It's like connecting worlds. You have people who are going, I want to invest in this industry, but I've invested, excuse me, I've heard people invest in processors and, you know, they pretty much haven't been successful because they weren't able to scale. I'm saying here's the entire infrastructure and this is an area where you can get, um, a good return on your investment and you're investing in infrastructure, but it's more traditional lending. So we just okay. provided that platform. 
That's good. Uh, I mean, that, that's good because that's what the industry lacks right now is access to capital. That's the, the probably the right. biggest thing for scale right now. I mean, that, that's awesome. Right. You guys are doing that. <laughs> oh, and, it, man. It, and it's crazy because like when you think about it, you know, with the, you know, 46,000 stores, that's a lot. You know, luckily we have 3 million pounds of biomass that we can tap into to see. But as you begin to grow, we're going to make sure we gonna need to make sure that all our farmers who are growing this year, they know, they fully understand our SOPs, how to do everything. And then they can scale to whatever size. But we have to make sure we have all the tools for them there. And funding is just one of those tools. Right. Oh, yeah. Um, are you guys doing that only in Georgia or nationwide? No, it's nationwide. Okay. Yeah, it's nationwide. Like we're only like right now we have Southeast, but I'm talking to a group in Colorado where we could do the same thing um, in terms of different farmers. We'll end up like, you know, we have, you know, all our farms in Southeast, but I'm sure as we go through, we'll have farms across the country. Right. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think that, you know, we'll probably have a, a little chat about that uh, after we get off the <laughs> after we get off this call. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, actually really interested in that service uh, right now. There's um, some some pretty big things on the horizon. The only thing right now is access to capital. So, uh, right. yeah, yeah, maybe we'll have a little chat. Yeah, and, you see it. <laughs> and you see it. And the crazy thing is this. It's like, you know, I tell people all the time, it was like, hey, I couldn't patent driving around in my pickup truck. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't tell everything that I was trying to do, but now we're releasing those things. So like you mentioned YouTube, a lot of those videos early on were from like two years ago. Right. I just didn't want to tell anybody what my plan was where now I'm kind of laying everything out because we have a large enough lead in terms of time that now I can say, these are the things that we're doing. Because if I would have told someone two, three years ago, they're like, Hey, I can do that same thing. Right. Now yeah. we're at a scale where we have all those things in place and it's more we can saturate the market we have a large market share because we're first to market you know on those things mm -hmm. and so that's the way that we one of our benefits in terms of growth and scalability is being the first to market on certain things right and i mean sometimes it's just really hard to just hold that stuff back because you're like i want to show everybody what we're doing yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, I mean i was going I, you know in two-year period i went to about close to 350 farms good for you Finding all, finding all the farms. So I lived on farms, getting to them and talking to people and hearing people, nah, you know, you get down the country mm -hmm. and people are like, I'm not growing that cannabis. Salt. I'm not growing that marijuana. <laughs> kind of educate and do all of that. But now a lot of those farmers are like, man, this is way better than tobacco and green beans and peas and all that stuff. This is a sustainable thing right? with us having those sales channels, you know? And it's, you know, I couldn't tell everybody everything where now I am. And as you said, Lance, you're looking and going, wait a minute, this changes the dynamic of what I thought you guys were, because yeah. I thought you were just helping the farmers when really we become a, a distribution company. And we're just going, we're just going to provide all, we look at processing the same way as we look at our trucks and the same way as we look at capital and the same way we look at our genetics. They're all just tools for the network to then provide us the quality product to then be able to sell. And so once you look at it in that way, I no longer place this value on processing like the processor is better than my logistics company. They're mm -hmm. all just part. And in a regular company, that's the way it is. Your contracts are how you make revenue and everything else is just part of the company. And that's how we really built it. So with what was what would you say was your largest hurdle, you know, with uh, outside of the education? Um whenever you were approaching these farmers, what, what was, what would you say would be the largest hurdle that you had to overcome? I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. And it's being a deep South, being a black man going around to, um, you know, initially starting off, it was just black farmers. And you have to just traditionally think about being a South. You have a product that people don't know. And then I'm coming in saying, Hey, I can tell you how to do this, but I have never farmed myself. <laughs> you know, so they were like, wait, wait, wait a minute. How is this going to work? But I was able to show them, like, this is how, you know, based upon the farmers that we have, this is how you're going to grow the product. This is how, you, how you're going to be able to sell the product. These are all the things. And then they finally got the model. But it was just farmers being skeptical about, um, you know, a product that they've never grown. Secondly, it's the, the hurdle of funding 
because they didn't have access to capital. A lot of farmers just didn't have access to capital. And then third, just being a South and race relations, um, it is one of those things that you can't ignore that. So I was very intentional about choosing the right individuals to partner with. So when I go, because it's a double-sided sword. If you go to a majority black farming gathering and I take, you know, the I take my white farming officer and then it's different. They're going to, people are going to look like they're trying to take our land. Right. If I go to a majority white farming gathering and it's just me, they're going to go, we can't trust him to really deliver on what he's saying he's going to do. But then Randy can go in and talk to them and then everything is fine. Right. And so it's double sided where, you know, we can't, we're in the South. You got to, you got to deal with that. But once you clear that hurdle, then it's just the funding piece and getting people, un- you know, comfortable with, you know, with him, it takes time, labor, and money. We can't get around that and just educating them on that piece. Yeah. I, I yeah. could only imagine. I mean, Jesus, <laughs> if that's the largest hurdle, man. And, and, you know, it's unfortunate that that is even a hurdle still today. You know, it, it really yeah. is. It really is. Yeah. And it, and it's crazy because like, South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee, we've gotten over those things. Like, it's crazy me living in Georgia, and now it's really like I'm being transformed back to 2017 because these farmers have never grown him. So when I go to them and I say, you know, this is the genetics you're going to use. I'm going to show you how to use it, how to grow it, how to do everything, and I have sales channels. They're going, ah, we don't know. And they don't understand when you have a contract with 46,000 stores, that doesn't really exist in this industry. Yeah. They don't really get the concept because they don't know that they don't know. Where our farmers in North Carolina, they're going, I'll grow 100 acres right now, and I'll pay my money, give me my contract, and, yeah, you're creating branded products. That's what I've been looking for. Mm-hmm. You know, with our farmers here in Georgia, they just don't know because they haven't had that experience of growing biomass for two years and it's sitting in a warehouse because the deal fell through. Right. That's a common theme across the industry right now. It's like CBD. Right. This last harvest, you couldn't hardly give it away for free. There was so much in the market. Right. So why did you guys decide to go after that contract specifically instead of just doing pri- uh, you know, private stores? Well, one of the things, and I, I would say, you know, it would, it would be nice to say that, hey, I was just this genius branding guy. I was like, that's where I was going to go. It was kind of a stroke of genius, a stroke of luck. Um, A very good friend of mine, he's been in tobacco business since the early 90s and been in the Circle K's and Sit Goals and all these different stories and has a huge distribution network. And what happened is as he was doing, you know, camp pre-rolls and cigarettes and doing all that stuff, the companies were asking him for CBD products outside of the tobacco substitutes. And so when he and I talked, I was like, this is a perfect you know, partnership because it gives us access to these stores. So it wasn't like I even just searched it out. It was like, man, you know, with this relationship, (laughs) we have access to all these stores. That's why now when I'm talking to people, I'm going, um, it really is like, you know, selling to the, you know, to, to, you know, the cartel where it's like, you can't miss orders. So I'm, I'm grateful. I have, you know, 3 million pounds sitting there because, Once you start shipping, you cannot miss an order. And they Mm -hmm. order 500 stores at a time. And so it's a good thing to have that. But as my partner said, he was like, but you better be ready. He said, because there's a lot that goes into making sure we manage and keep this contract. And that was a thing where all the work that I've done in terms of getting all these farms together, now it shows and pays off because we can then supply. And after that contract, we had several others we're going to be releasing here. I'm doing press releases on, which is 15,000 stores in the Midwest and different areas where I'm going. Wow, this is really going to take a lot of legs, you know? Right. Where do you personally see the industry going in regards of CBD? Because there was, uh, you know, whenever the before the farm bill passed, there was a huge, you know, uh, influx with with materials, uh, you know, isolate was at like, you know, an all time high. We're talking nine grand a right. kilo. Uh, but now it's almost like what a grand a kilo, baby. Thousand. Yeah, like where thousand. where do you, where do you see the the CBD side going? Well, this is what's going to happen, and this is what I what I had pre- predicted a while back. You have individuals who, and this is what I always say in this industry: you have 
two types kind of going into the industry. You have individuals who farming, know it, know about the product, and you have guys with money on the back end, on the outside, kind of going, hey, I could come in and spend $7 million to build this processor, X, Y, and Z, and so on and so forth. Um, likewise, you have people who have been getting high and saying, hey, I can do this. <laughs> and they, they know that, but they don't know business. And you have the guys who are saying, hey, I know how to run a business. What's going to happen is there's going to be a correction in the market. And what that correction and shakeout is going to be are the individuals who thought they could spend their, their way to the top, they're going to be flush and go, you know what, I've, t- I've lost my ass on this. I'm going to move out. It's good. I've taken my loss. I'll, take, I'll do those <laughs> losses on my balance sheet. I'm good. And the people who are just like, I can get high and I just know it, but didn't invest in the knowledge and doing a partnership with someone who can help run and manage the business, they're going to be shaken out because they're going to not prove to be able to go, yeah, you know the product, but you don't know business. What's going to happen is you're going to see more partnerships happening as people prepare for larger companies to come in. Mm -hmm. And then what's going to happen is when you look at the CBD market, you're going to have how many other number of companies, whether it's 10, 30, 40, whatever that number is, that then your really large companies, Cokes, Pepsis, Monsantos, whoever, will say, this company, I can plug and play. They have everything lined up. That's the company I'm going to go with. And those will be your like tier one major level companies. And you see, you're see, you seeing those companies make moves now. You could see it on LinkedIn and social media as you're like you're doing press releases and you see them on Hemp Industry Daily that those companies will start looking at partnerships and they'll, those will be kind of t- partnering with really large companies that'll come in and say, we want to buy X percentage of your company and just work with you. Then you have your second tier companies who are going, we're not looking to go that big, but we still want to have a foothold in this industry. And then they will start really targeting some of those mid level contracts because they couldn't fill the large ones and they still would do really well. And then you have that third tier of the individuals who are saying, I own my three or four CBD stores and I kind of work with these people and I still have a really good business, but I'm not interested in doing big business. And that really is kind of the shakeup where you'll have just like traditional business. People thought this was like the gold rush and you didn't have to apply normal business um, ideas, thought processes. And it's like, no, we still have to apply that where some people just based upon the structure of their business and how they operate are going to be big business, middle business, small business. And that's what's going to happen. I mean, that's really going to happen because the people who are going, I can get in and I can make all this money and I can broker on this and I can, you know, make $2 million on this deal from my mom's, like that's going to be shaken out. <laughs> yeah. there's, you've already seen the market correction where we're going, no, that liter of, you know, hemp or that kilogram of product that you were saying is 8,000. This guy wants a thousand kilograms and we can verify it tonight, but it's like, it's 11 o'clock. What bank is verifying this? All that, (laughs) that's going to be shaken out and it's going to be real businesses who run through and really run the business. And then you'll see the actual companies who are actually operating, who can tell you about a balance sheet, a P and L of how we do everything. They'll take the stigma away. And then also you can like larger companies can operate and they will bring in the cash to really manage all those things. So you see it in cannabis where people were just like, I'm just going to try to spend my way to the top, but they weren't smart in terms of how they executed that capital. And now you see them licking their wounds and saying, we have assets we can't do anything with. Yeah. I mean, MedMen, that's a prime example. You know, MedMen's going through some management issues. Uh, you know, it, it you're exactly right. You know, there was a younger generation, you know, getting into this that were, uh, you know, pre OGs, if you will, you know, the older growers, like the Jack Harrow, right. um, you know, generation, you know, and then the younger right. generation, like my generation, then, you know, my brother's generation, Gen Y's or whatever the hell they're called, uh, right. you know, that came into this at the right time with, you know, some capital. And like you said, they're just spending their way to the top. And I, I couldn't agree mm-hmm. more. You know, I, I see that, that, that side of the house going that way because, the broker side of the house right now is a disaster. You know, there's brokers. Yeah. I got this. I got that. I was on the phone yesterday with some kid who's based out of Washington doing deals in Oklahoma on the cannabis side. And he's saying, I'm clearing uh, over 100K a week on a 4% commission. I'm like, 
what? What are you talking about? Like, what kind of volume are we talking about here? And then he's talking right. about these products and these products and these products. It's like there's there's no standardization when it comes to a the distribution and b the quality of products. And I think you're exactly right. You know, it's going to take a little bit of time to say what an isolate is, what the process is, because there's so many different variations of what a product is. You know, with isolate, it right. varies in in percentage and potency. You know, from 94 point something all the way up to ninety nine point eight. You know, so there's right. just that that wide variation, and then you know how mm. it's going to get implemented because, uh, like you said, like these big brands that want to work with CBD. So, with that being said, do you see like Coke or um, you know large uh, big bo- big box brands putting this product into their products right now, or do you see them kind of offering it like uh, like a sugar free option, you know, with or without sugar, like CBD or without, or is it just going to yeah, be an it's going to I believe I believe it'll be a couple of years before because what what is happening is this: the last thing you want to have if you're if you have this really huge cash cow a coat, they they're doing well without CBD. You don't want to risk that, right? And then it messes up your your brand. And so what they're doing is saying, we'll sit on the sidelines, see what happens with FDA, excuse me, mm-hmm. how. They approve what comes in. And I've sat on some of these calls with really large attorneys and really like the cokes of the world. And that's the thing. It's we're going to wait and see kind of how everything shakes out. And then what we're going to do is we'll find the people who actually can scale or have already scaled to the level that we need. And then we just do a partnership with them. Right. And that's it's going to happen. But really what, you know, it's kind of, you know, one of the things I learned is don't do any business. Don't do a business deal with someone if they don't have skin in the game. <laughs> if you have these guys who are going, I make, I clear a thousand, hundred thousand a week and this and that, you know, I'm making this percentage and all of that stuff. They have no skin in the game. They have no money invested. It's just, I'm calling this guy, calling this guy, calling that guy. But what money are they really making? Right. And so that's the market correction. And then it will happen enough where the market collection happens enough where the imitators are, you know, pretty much force out the industry because of just not being able to perform. And that's where you're going to see a really large companies come in and say, let's look at the landscape and see who's delivered on what they said time and time again. And then who has the scalability to match the contracts that we have. And that's where you're going to see companies really. So you saw, I just saw something on where CBS is partnering with the company um, I think an Australian company to do products that are going to CVS. Those are the types of things that you'll start to see happen mm-hmm. because those businesses have been around and they can show scalability. So that was the whole thing. The reason why for me, I was like, let's go for the gusto and do a, you know, <laughs> a deal with 46,000 stores because then if I can show that and then if I can show a branded product that I've been able to partner with, we're poised to then take on the Gatorades, Pepsis, Cokes of the world, because you can show we already have the logistics down to be able to move product to these types of stores already. Mm-hmm. And you're exactly right because uh, you know people like that are in the industry that you know they I hear it all the time. You know, Coke's going to come in, Big Farm is going to come in, and you know buy everybody out. It's a it's a fun time to be in the industry. You know, it's good. Like looking back on this, it's going to be. Um, you know, sitting around a campfire somewhere, you know, laughing and joking about, you know, the broker days and, you know, CBD headaches and all that stuff. You know, it's, it's an interesting time to be in the industry. So it's, it's kind of interesting. So my, my business partner, a uh, very good friend of mine uh, named Dr. Rashawn Hodge here in Georgia, uh, we went to undergrad together and he ended up breaking his neck playing Ooh. basketball, freak accident. And he had to do two neck surgeries. Now, the crazy thing is he's a pain specialist. So he was a guy giving Percocets and all that stuff. And then he was on his own meds. And he was like, dude, I'm depressed and this and that. So he ended up becoming um, just like almost like a forefather here in the state of Georgia for getting. He has the first medical card in the state of Georgia. Wow. As I started seeing him go through and do everything and help write legislation, I was like, look, how can I help you? in that business like what can i do and he was like this is 2016 going to 17 he was like do hemp nobody's doing hemp nobody's learning about it and all that 
And so I had a cell tower management company. Um, and so I'm driving around the farms anyway. And I got like, you know, I carried 200 diesel, 200 <laughs> gallons of diesel on the back of my truck and just going around the farms and filling up generators and doing all that stuff. And so I started talking to farmers about it. And as I started getting out and doing all that, I said, you know what? Here's an untapped market of no one looking at CBD. And nobody cares. Nobody knows when this hemp is going to be pr- approved. But when it does, this is going to be way bigger than cannabis because you can grow across state lines. Cannabis, you can't. You're landlocked. And so as the farm bill came out, I was already doing it for a year and a half having these farmers lined up, but it was really by like a fluke accident where my buddy just got injured and I was like, let me help you out. And he was like, do him. And then I'm the, I'm the, um, the director for the, the, um, the hemp director for minorities for medical marijuana. And so one of the things that I wanted to do was help black and brown farmers get in the hemp industry. And so the, um, the owner, operator, president, you know, of, you know, Minorities for Medical Marijuana, um, her name is Roz McCarthy. And Roz is big in terms of getting people into this industry um, and then just really helping minorities. When I met her, we were at the Capitol. She was like, you know what? We need somebody for him. <laughs> and really through those two individuals, it was like God telling me, like, here, go through and do this. And so I always tell her, I was like, no matter what, I'm always the hemp director for Minorities for Medical Marijuana because – she was very instrumental in going, you know what, we need somebody to do this. You fast forward, everybody in the cannabis side is trying to pivot and come to, to you know, CBD and hemp because there's less legislation, less of a barrier to get into with market, you know, the money and, the, and all of that. And people are just trying to flood to cannabis. And just so happened that I just had a head start of three years on everybody. <laughs> I didn't intend to do that. Like, I would love to say like, oh, yeah, I was brilliant. I knew. I didn't. I didn't know when it was going to happen. And just like God's grace, when the farm bill happened, you know, it was literally like, I got two years ahead of everybody. Yep. And so in that, I could then run at a different pace. But it was re- literally my buddy broke his neck and said, hey, I'm going to be doing some things at the state capitol. I go to the state capitol. I meet Roz. Roz is talking to me about, hey, we need somebody to kind of manage the hemp on our side. And no one was doing it. And I was like, man, before you know it, I'm lobbying in South Carolina, different states to get farmers licenses. I get some licenses. Man, I'm in the game. There you go. Nice. Hey, (laughs) everybody's got their story. You know, it's always interesting to hear because I ask everybody when they come on the show, you know, how they got started. You know, what's, you know, what's their story? You know, because we're pretty... (laughs) you're pretty much on the ground floor for a brand new industry. It's like being, you know, centuries ago with alcohol and tobacco, you know, it's like a brand new industry is forming in front of us all the time. Yeah. I tell farmers that all the time and different people I'm going, we really are at the end of prohibition. And it just so happens that, you know, where I'm on the forefront of creating the infrastructure of what is going to be known in the CBD market and what's coming. And I was like, I didn't, I couldn't make it up, but the more I do it, I try to make sure I have individuals around me who are really successful at what they do, you know, attorney and chairman and farmers and, you know, our staff inside to make sure everybody understands kind of their role and they've already been successful in it. But you're right. We're creating the infrastructure of an industry that didn't exist. And so whether it's, you know, you talk, I, you know, I was talking like Madam C.J. Walker doing the same thing with hair care. You look at the Kennedys are doing everything with the end of prohibition and Seagrams and Shandon, like Moet. That's how they really built built traditional and initial um, wealth was like we, they had an idea and they didn't understand. Like, you know what? We're going to take the risk and go to places that other people didn't go. And in that, taking that risk and driving all these farms, I can't tell you how many times I had to tuck my you know tail and go, nope, I didn't get anything this year. 2017, nope. Mm-hmm. You know, I got one, but that lady doesn't want to grow. So it's two years of working, not showing any benefit, but then 2019 getting, you know, all those farmers that I had helped when a farm bill passed, they were retroactively approved. And I was like, I'm in the game. Mm-hmm. And then from there, it was like, you know, racing at a, a faster pace because then I could show proof of concept. So it was just being in the right place, right time, but doing the hard work, you know, and just even though 
I was getting a lot of no's. I just kept pushing, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's an inspirational story right there, you know, because, uh, you know, a lot of the entrepreneurial, you know, advice, uh, you know, gurus out there, it's just like, you know, don't quit, you know, put in the work, don't quit, you know, keep your, your yeah. nose to the grind. And, you know, it's obviously paying off and, you know, people are starting to notice. And like you said, you know, don't announce your moves before you make them. And now you got the right moves to, to announce and everybody's starting to, you know, really kind of like, wait a second, Verde Leaf, you know, and they're really starting right. to take notice, you know, and it's good to see. Yeah, I'm really appreciative. Like I tell people, I'm a servant leader. Um, we have an inverted, and all our farmers, they know this. We have an inverted hierarchy at our company um, where the farmers are at the very top. Um, and me as the present CEO, I'm at the very bottom. So I serve. I always tell them, I'm like, think about it like this. You have a consultant to sell your product, but you don't pay me anything. Essentially, I'm paying you. And they're like, wait a minute. And I go, <laughs> look, I work hard to make sure I'm selling your product. And when they get that, I'm going, you guys are at the top of the food chain. It makes them kind of like, this is different. But when they understand the model, they go, wow, this really makes sense and this helps us. And that really is the thing when I'm telling people, I'm like, it's such a blessing because I couldn't have wrote this story this way. But as I'm seeing it unfold, it really is one of those things that I believe when we do tell the story, it's going to be like a huge magnitude because of the work and being on the forefront of the industry and getting all these farmers together and doing all this stuff. Um, but I really come from a place of just, I'm extremely blessed and I'm blessed to be a blessing to serve. Hey man. Yeah. It, it's, that's awesome to hear. It's really awesome to hear. Um, well, Jackson, you know, I appreciate your time, you know, coming onto the show. Um, how can, you know, how can everyone listening, everyone watching out there, how can they follow on Verde Leaf's journey? All right, so our website is www.verdeleafgroup.com. Um, and if you want to get in touch with us, we have a contact us and you can submit your information. Again, that's www.verdeleafgroup.com. Our phone number is 404-334-9962. Um, so if you have services you want to provide or you have your farmer and want to get involved, just give us a call and uh, we'll make sure we get in touch with you. And we're on LinkedIn and we're on um, Instagram and all of those, Facebook and all of that. Um, <laughs> our YouTube channel is Verde Leap Group. I try to put all that stuff out there, but it's cool. You know, they can look at all that stuff and kind of see what we're doing. Right. And I'll, I'll put all those, uh, you know, links and, you know, phone number and stuff below in the description whenever we post it on YouTube for you. Very cool. Thank yeah. you so much, Lance. I really appreciate it. I'm very grateful and uh, humble to be on your show. I really appreciate it.